here's a funny thing. Daniel was not certain his father had remembered at all. Perhaps he'd gotten the date wrong or written down the name of the club incorrectly. He had peered out discreetly into the crowd during the laughs and the applause breaks, but the stage lights made individuals indistinguishable. It would be typical of his father to make a big deal out of emailing for the information and then find a way to miss the show. As he came off stage, he met some strangers who had enjoyed his performance. Then he saw Paul awaiting his attention, small and frail in his overcoat, as though the weight of the wool itself might buckle the man's aging legs. Daniel disengaged from the knot of admirers and went to his father for a hug, a moment of genuine human connection before the familial guards came up, the tensions, the mannerisms. They stood awkwardly for a moment, assessing one another, shuffling. I need a cigarette, can we? Paul trailed off with a gesture toward the door, and together they stepped out of the warmth. You're funny. Thanks. I I'm glad you could make it. You're much smarter than most of the guys who went on that stage tonight. Daniel shrugged. He shifted his feet. He agreed, but it wasn't a thing he liked to say aloud. He preferred to mask his arrogance. Paul sighed smoke. He blinked in a way that was almost a wince, almost a flinch. It told Daniel that he was trying not to say something. Or, more accurately, hoping to be coaxed. Daniel did not know how not to oblige. What? Paul feigned confusion. What? Don't do the Meisner thing with me. There was something you wanted to say. Paul nodded. He sighed again. Shifted his head from side to side for a moment as though he was weighing options. I think you know. Daniel thought he knew too, but he'd been wrong before. He waited. There's a bit in there that you really have to stop doing. Daniel had correctly surmised his father's thought. He knew which piece Paul was talking about. It was this. The last time I visited my grandmother, Alzheimer's was just setting in. Every time she saw me, she thought it was my birthday and gave me five dollars. It was exhausting to deal with. I had to keep walking in and out of that room. For the record, that is not a self-loathing anti-Semitic joke about a cultural relationship with money that values it above human decency. It's a self-loathing anti-capitalist joke about a societal relationship with money that values it over human decency. She had just reached that point in the progression of the disease at which every conversation turns into a surreal 1970s television game show. She'd say, I went into that place with the buildings and the smell, and we'd all shout, Manhattan? Yes! I was with that know-it-all lady with the flowered dress and the long, boring stories. Your best friend, Katie? Yes! We saw that horrible guy. We need more clues. He used to be horrible in New York, and then he was horrible all over the country, and now he's horrible from space. Howard Stern? Yes! Congratulations, Grandma. You're going on to the Dementia Pyramid. Who are you people? Things you yell at the dinner table. Where am I? Things you shot from the bathroom. Ed Asner, Benjamin Netanyahu, people you mistake for your dead husband. Yay, Grandma, great clues. You're a big winner. I remember my mother was all freaked out, realizing that she was facing a genetic crapshoot. She said, Daniel, you have to tell me if I start to show symptoms, so I'll know when it's time to take my own life. I said, Mom, we just had this conversation 20 minutes ago. Hands in his pockets, shoulders up against the cold, Daniel risked the guess. The Alzheimer's run? Yeah, it's not funny. Gets a lot of laughs and a huge applause break. That doesn't mean it's funny. Then? It would destroy your mother if she saw it. She can handle more than you think. It's about her mother. Yes. Paul pulled smoke. He pressed his lips together. It's really offensive. Different people are offended by different things. I think you've forgotten how awful it was. Daniel said, no. It wasn't cute, Danny. It wasn't funny. It was tragic. That was when, with absolute certainty, Daniel knew he was right and his father was wrong. In 1974, Daniel was 10 years old. He went with his parents and his sister to visit Grandma and Grandpa at their home in New Jersey for a big, tense Thanksgiving dinner, long before his grandmother's mind began to slip. During one of the difficult pauses, 
while his mother bathed in a lifetime of familial subtext and his father tried to imagine how he was being judged by his in-laws, to avoid putting another bite of inedible turkey-flavored particle board into his mouth, Daniel said, This summer I'm going to camp. I'm going to ride horses and I'm learn to play guitar. His grandmother, still healthy in her late sixties, said, I went to a camp once. Grandpa laughed sharply. Daniel's parents, Paul and Ellen, gasped. His sister, Lindsay, stared at her food. When things made people laugh, she went quiet, as though she had to analyze every word in careful silence. Grandma went on with barely a pause. Spent nine months of my life in a yard full of gypsies and queers playing liar's poker. With a deliberate gesture, she rolled up a sleeve to look at the numbers tattooed on her forearm. Pair of threes. She paused, looking at an imagined opponent. Three fives. Grandpa laughed now in a way that was joyous and actively supportive as he saw the discomfort on the faces of Daniel's parents. Paul said, Stop it, Sally, that's terrible. Ellen sighed. Paul's jaw tensed, compressing rage between his teeth. Daniel watched it all sorting out as best he could the source of his parents' discomfort, trying to reverse-engineer the backstory that made his grandmother's joke so potent. Grandpa, always ready to put horror under laughing glass, grinned at his wife. He said to Daniel's parents, or perhaps to Daniel himself, You know, that's when I fell in love with her. Do you know how sharp you have to be to win with the same numbers every day? Besides, I always liked skinny girls. Come on, man. And it sounded like some sort of warning. Paul glanced toward Daniel and Lindsay, clearly hoping his father-in-law would follow his gaze, would censor his wit for the benefit of his kids. Grandpa would not be silenced through intimidation or outrage, though. He would not be quieted by the squeamish manners of the man who had married his daughter. I saw her across the yard, and I thought, My God, her tights are loose! He took a beat to let the shock register on the faces of Paul and Ellen before he tagged it with... Then I realized she wasn't wearing tights. That image made Daniel laugh a little, and Grandma fell apart with giggles. Ellen said, Really, guys, this is wrong. Set an example. You don't make jokes about tragedy. Grandma feigned anger, but Daniel could see that she truly reveled in the moment. She smelled their offense like blood in the comedic waters and could not help herself. Oh, Ellen, no. We're Jews. We don't believe in tragedy. We believe in horror, atrocity, and injustice, and we recognize them all as inherently hilarious. At that, Grandpa and Paul both laughed, and Ellen raised her hands in surrender. If it was to be a battle of jokes, she knew she could not compete. To emphasize the urgency of her statement, Grandma leaned across the table directly toward Daniel and poked at the side of his head with a stiff finger. Never forget. Daniel hadn't. He had remembered every moment of the conversation, and over the years he had understood with increasing wonder just what his grandparents were so funny about. As he learned their history and the larger history of which they had been a part, the series of jokes came into focus one at a time, until he realized that the miracle of his grandparents was not their mere survival. It was their ability to remember and still to feel joy. The miracle was that their laughter was genuine and warm, not manic. On the sidewalk outside the club, he recounted to his father just the important points. Grandma said, we're Jews. We don't believe in tragedy. Paul snorted and smoke came with it. She also said, never forget. Look where that got her. Daniel chuckled. That's funny. Don't use it. Only if you promise you will. What? You mean in conversations? Maybe you can sneak it into an academic treatise on the danger of cliché. Or when you're talking to your therapist about how insensitive and inappropriate your son is. Paul shook his head. He stamped his feet in the cold as though it could warm him up. He pulled on the cigarette as though that could warm him up. Do you remember the night she said that to me, Thanksgiving, 74? Said what to you? That we don't believe in tragedy. She and Grandpa were doing shtick together. You and Mom were very upset. I think I've blocked most of those Thanksgivings out. They were difficult for me. That's why I have to wrap it all in jokes, Dad. All the horror, all the loss, all the injustice. 
It's the only way to preserve it. Without the lens, it hurts too much. It gets blocked. That's what they were telling me. That's why they were so, so funny together. You don't remember that conversation. Paul shook his head. He shrugged. Those holidays had been problematic. Tension beforehand, raising dread. Ellen's parents always judging him for his lack of financial savvy, poking at him for the years he had spent barely supporting her and the kids before he got his footing. The overcooked, overly ostentatious meals that served as a passive-aggressive demonstration of decadent opulence. The dirty jokes that were supposed to seem risque and naughty rather than vulgar, just because they came from people with gray hair, not from construction workers. You muttered and cursed about how inappropriate they were all the way home in the station wagon, Daniel chuckled. It was pretty hilarious. Paul shrugged, unable to find the humor. He said, I don't remember. Thank you.